All right, hello. Uh, my name is Simon Wood, Deputy Director of Grid Alternatives National Tribal Program. Um, thanks for having me. I think this morning we touched on a few topics that I kind of baked into this slideshow. So um, I'll try not to make it too redundant, but um, you know, just thinking about our conversations this morning and you know, exploring EPC decision making. Um, you know, I think one big takeaway is to follow the process um, that was kind of outlined this morning as far as working with the utilities, working with your um, authority having jurisdiction and the permitting, working with the tribes to identify projects. And um, typically what we find since our projects are so grant driven is that we put to together a development plan, apply for grants and funding to build the projects, get awarded the funds, and then we, we almost have to backtrack to verify that we can do the projects um, after the funds have been awarded, which is kind of putting the cart before the horse a little bit. And I think a big reason why that happens is probably twofold. Number one, um, the tribe probably doesn't have representation um, when looking at the grant and basically verifying the scope of work and what they're going after um, and have like an organized approach. Um, so it's kind of like you throw your hat in the ring and you hope you get it and then you, you kind of figure it out. And probably not the best way to go about doing it. Um, so you know, one big takeaway is the energy planning and, and the importance of that. And, you know, there's funds out there. Um, there's funds through the Tribal Solar Accelerator Fund within Grid Alternatives and, and a number of different um, grant opportunities where tribes can basically realize funds up front to invest into their energy program and planning. Um, so this would be hopefully identifying someone within the tribe who can basically manage their energy plan. Um, number two, identify projects up front. So when you're applying for grants, you have a good idea of what you're gonna do and you know the viability of each project, whether it can be built or not. Like just through you know, lessons learned, some have been in our control, some have been out of our control. It's an easy way to get in trouble and create a lot more work for yourself if you don't have a defined project going into a grant. Um, there's been a lot of cases where we look at one community um, and the infrastructure and the utility won't allow the solar system. And this is kind of after we've gotten funds for a grant. And this has happened in a few cases, remote, you know, rural areas where the utility substations aren't you know, up to par for you know, future retrofits and integration of renewable energy. Um, you know, there's one instance that I'm thinking about is, it was only a $500,000 project. We got the grant, we developed the project, and then we went through the process of submitting the interconnection applications and the utility rejected the applications and said that we could only install up to a 10 kW AC system, um, basically downstream of this substation, which fed maybe 30 homes, a gas station, a hotel, and a bunch of other buildings. And they would only allow us to install a 10 kW system there. Um, or we had the option of putting like $380,000 into their substation to upgrade it. Um, a lot of these issues can be avoided with like a proper energy plan. Um, in that case, the tribe could have worked with the utility up front, verified any issues, and probably still would have walked away from the project or moved it elsewhere. Um, but that's, you know, that's just one example of, of following the steps. So like when I think about projects, I think about, you know, development, energy planning, organizing the needs of the tribe what they're looking to do. Are they looking to do 50 homes? Are they looking to do a community solar project? Um, 
and then identify any you know, potential issues um, so you can determine solutions up front instead of when you're trying to scramble to build the project. Um, you know, a lot of that has been talked about today, which would be feasibility studies that cost a lot of money. Um, a lot of the time you have to pay utilities to do feasibility studies. You have to do third party feasibility studies for, you know, the, the customer. Um, feasibility studies are very expensive and that's something that would come out of the, the planning grant. Um, so the tribe isn't taking on any expenditures during the development phase. Um, and then with, with the feasibility studies as well, that, that'll help verify the return on investment of the project and the benefits, um, and also what else approvals are needed. If land approval is needed, um, you know, if there's easements, floodplains, anything like that, it gives you time to get out ahead of these issues and, and have solutions. Um, so kind of like at that point, after the feasibility study, if the funding hasn't been identified for the project, that's when you would go and submit for the project through DOE, um, Office of Indian Energy, a third party funder like TSAF um, to build the project. Um, because then you know clearly what you're, what you're getting into. You should have your project expenses. You should have a really clear plan on what you're doing. And then you start going through the design and engineering, um, the structural and electrical engineering that's kind of not required in the feasibility study, more the construction engineering. Um, and you put together the inter interconnection application with the utility. Um, and then you kind of go through the contracts, identifying your construction partners, legal support, uh, and then you kind of go through the, the procurement and uh, project execution. Um, so, you know, with, with us, with the workforce development piece that we offer, um, we, we're, you know, we're really focused on workforce development. Um, it's an amazing program and it also helps us in the field too. Um, we need, you know, people in the field helping us install these systems and it's, it's just a win-win for everybody. Um, I think I kind of touched on it, but basically with, with training and also O&M service contracts, we write that budget into our construction contract so then it can be reimbursed to the tribe. Um, so the tribe is really not incurring any costs while we you know, train their local community on how to build solar projects and maintain them. Um, so you know, as far as the workforce development goes, the, you know, the big picture and mission for us is to kind of establish you know, local economic development for tribal communities. So the hope is, you know, we do a big portfolio of projects. We've trained a number of the local um, people where they can then potentially either work with the tribe, um, like under maintenance or housing or something like that, or even better, start their own renewable energy company or tribal company to maintain these projects. Um, and O&M and services is definitely um, an important aspect of, of keeping these solar systems online for 20 to 25 years plus. Um, so the hope is, is that the trainees go back to their communities. They're um, managing and servicing these projects with our oversight. Um, so, you know, I think that when people talk about O&M and service, um, <clears throat> it's not as complicated as it sounds. Uh, it's, it's, you know, with solar, fortunately, there's really no moving parts. Um, there's only a few failure points. Um, so the O&M and service is, is fairly easy. When we leave a project, we basically go through a big uh, commissioning checklist and commissioning report to verify that everything's been wired properly, everything's tested, um, you know, everything's operational and working as it should be. Once we leave a project, it really should run itself. Um, you know, there's sometimes minor issues. Um, some of it can be on the communication side where we have like an online communication system that is generating uh, through a portal that you can access on a website to see how the system's operating. Typically, you know, probably the biggest issue we have is someone unplugs our 
monitoring system from a router or something like that, or it drops communication, and then you just reestablish communication. Um, that's one piece that's important to keep going. The online monitoring is kind of how we determine the health of the solar system remotely. We can, we can watch the system, we can see if there's alerts or errors or any issues going on, if it's underproducing, and that's when we would kind of go through and do more thorough O&M. So, like the the day-to-day O&M that we would recommend um, to a partner would be do quarterly inspections, go up on the roof, look at all the panels, make sure there's nothing broken, everything looks good, you know, all of the wires are off the roof, there's nothing dangling, the inverters look good, the lights are green, um, and that's, you know, that's really about the quarterly inspection, which, you know, anyone can really do. Um, it's when you run into bigger issues that may not necessarily be covered under our workmanship warranty or grid alternatives workmanship warranty. We provide a five-year warranty on our work. Um, typically, the solar panels are warrantied for 20 to 25 years. The inverters are typically warrantied for uh, 10 to 15 years. Um, so the major equipment is warrantied. So it's like, okay, so you have a inverter that failed that needs to be warrantied and sent back to the manufacturer so we can get an RMA and get a new inverter. Um, some of that would be covered under the manufacturer. Uh, the manufacturer would provide you with a replacement inverter uh, if it's still under warranty. But then the question comes like, okay, well, they'll send us inverter, but who's gonna install it? Um, typically, inverter companies don't give you funds for labor to go and do the reinstallation. So it's like, well, where, where's that money coming from? It should come out of the O&M budget that we provided. Um, and then who's doing the work? Um, the hope would be that we have trained someone in that community well enough to go and do an inverter remove and replace. We can work with a local electrician or we can dispatch our crew. Um, so in cases like that, if there's equipment failure whether it's under warranty or not, um, if there was, say, a big hailstorm um, or a damaged panel or something like that, that's what we call reactive service. So if you were setting up like an O&M and service contract for these projects, you would basically have like what's included on the yearly inspections or quarterly inspections, um, what what the service is that you're providing and what, then what the cost is for the reactive service. So reactive service would be a billable service if we had to send an electrician to go out to swap an inverter, someone's gonna get charged for time. So it's like that should come out of the original project budget um, so the tribe is not basically paying for the reactive service. But um, the idea is, is that you set up a service contract um, and then you specify the punch list for the, basically the quarterly inspections and then the reactive service. Who's gonna be doing the reactive service? Who's gonna get billed? And what does it include? And that's really important, especially when you start talking community solar. If an inverter fails and half the system goes down, um, now you're talking a lot of lost revenue and a lot of lost KW hours where someone needs to go out there quickly to replace the inverter or fix the inverter. Um, and within that contract, you should have established who's doing the work and how much it's gonna cost, like an hourly rate, probably with an escalator over 10 years, but it's really important to get those service contracts set up so the investment's protected, um, which we've, we've seen it a lot, unfortunately, where you know, we go and build projects and, um, you know, sometimes people don't even look at them or, you know, the building owner leaves and a new tenant takes it and the systems just get neglected and, you know, sometimes they're just not operational. Um, so it's like one, you know, one reference and we do a lot of work for Spokane and Washington. I think we have close to 400 projects there. Um, 
And now it's become the point where they can justify having their own electrical and service department just to manage the solar systems. Um, so that, you know, that's really important. Um, and, you know, the hope is, is that the reactive service funds and the contracts can stay within the community as a revenue generator and also to maintain their investment. Um, uh, so that's, that's really important. And I think like going back to the process of, of following the proper steps to expedite the projects and to build them properly, um, it's just really important that tribes protect themselves, um, you know, from the utility, from the grant source, um, from a lot of other factors to make sure that they can develop and install, um, you know, proper projects that are, are really gonna achieve what they're looking for because sometimes they don't, which is really unfortunate. Um, I think another thing that was on the list was decommissioning strategies. Um, and this would be if you had a older solar system that's failing. Um, which we see from time to time. Um, with the solar industry, it moves pretty quick and equipment is replaced every year. So systems that were installed 10, 20 years ago, there's a good chance now that the equipment on site is now obsolete. You probably can't find replacement panels or replacement inverters. Um, if a system like that has totally failed, you're kind of looking at a, a decommissioning of that site. Um, and in my mind, it would be a decommission and a retrofit. Um, so hopefully you can reuse the existing uh, infrastructure that's there, the point of interconnection, you know, the wiring on the AC side, um, and basically just add new equipment. Um, so with that, there comes challenges. You most likely have to go through and apply for a new interconnection agreement or a modification to your interconnection agreement because you're changing equipment, most likely equipment or system size. Um, so you still have to be involved with the utility uh, if you are gonna modify the system. Um, but ultimately, you know, at the end of the day, that interconnection point is reusable. Um, and that's a big piece of a solar project is to identify a good point of interconnection. If it's already there, you might as well reuse it with the infrastructure you put in the ground. Um, and then, you know, on the decommissioning side, what we're also now seeing is um, older energy sites or substations, um, even small power plants that are being decommissioned and then reusing those points of interconnection from the original power plant to tie in solar systems, uh, which is really interesting with, you know, coal-fired power plants going away, reusing those interconnection points with larger systems to replace the power plants. Um, so that's, I guess, kind of my gist. I think I just wanted to go, I'll try to skip through my slides here if I can. Um, so grid alternatives, I think we kind of went into it, but you know, our mission really is you know, partnership and development with tribal communities, um, workforce development and education while we're building the projects and then solar, solar installations. Um, and our solar installations can be anywhere from small off-grid projects in Navajo, like we talked about, to larger commercial scale projects. Um, maybe what I'll do while I'm, while I'm here, I'll just talk really quickly about the Tribal Solar Accelerator Fund. Um, so this is a, basically a philanthropy department within GRID that, um, uh, is a grant mechanism where uh, the Tribal Solar Accelerator Fund, or the acronym for that is TSAF. TSAF um, is donated quite a lot of money from private donors, state, federal donors, um, to basically build this program. So TSAF within GRID's National Tribal Program is able to allow grants. And we actually have a grant application um, that's open right now, um, and it's a really good way to kind of get your foot in the door or to get grants for energy planning um, and other mechanisms, solar projects. Um, it's a really good resource, so I'd 
recommend, and I've got a bunch of um, pamphlets that I can pass around after that has more information about TSAF and GRID's tribal program. Um, but certainly something to look into uh, if you're looking for a grant for a project. Uh, let's see. All right. Um, yeah, that's, that's kind of where we work all over the place. Um, so this is kind of just like a spotlight in New Mexico. Um, we've built a bunch of grid-tied, off-grid projects, uh, commercial projects. We've partnered with a bunch of tribes in the area um, and other partners. Uh, most recently, we worked with the Pueblo of Santa Ana, um, and we actually just finished a project. Well, we're finishing a project. We passed our final inspections on Tuesday with the Pueblo of Santa Ana's local inspector. And now we're just waiting for P&M to basically close the loop, um, go to our site and set the meter. Um, so we hope to have that system energized uh, by the end of the month. <clears throat> it was a 138 kW system that was installed on the wellness center uh, just down the road. So it's a grid tied system, um, really nice system. It hopefully will offset 30 to 50% of the electrical usage of that building. And then we set it up so we basically, we're thinking we built it in two phases. So this first phase is phase one, which is 50% of the roof. And then if we get the opportunity, we'll do phase two, which is the last 50%, which will um, hopefully bring us close to 70% offset of the electrical usage, uh, which is great. But um, the Santa Ana project um, started as a TSAF project. Uh, so uh, Perdita applied for a grant with TSAF, and then we realized that we wanted to go bigger. Um, so we identified some other funding streams to add to the project budget. So we worked with um, a company called AES Corporation who provided funds, um, as well as All Points North, which is another uh, organization. And they ultimately, between TSAF, All Points North, and AES made it possible to build the 138 kW system, uh, which was great. Um, so let's see, I know I'm kind of going over, but uh, just to highlight Santa Ana, so some of the projects we did, um, last year we installed five residential installs. Um, through that project, we, I think we had closer to five workforce development trainees who stayed on, I think it was six weeks to help build all the projects. Uh, it's relatively small, 30 kW, so 6 kW on each home, which was, I think, about 13 or 14 panels on average. Um, and it's estimated to produce about um, uh, 50, 52,000 kilowatt hours per year. Uh, so you multiply that by 25, the expected system lifespan, um, pretty good savings. And typically when we go into neighborhoods, we look at the roof, if there's usable roof space, we try to max it out. So we're offsetting 100 to 120% of the building's usage. Uh, and that way you're not guaranteed, but um, you're pretty confident that you're gonna offset all of the kilowatt hours that the utility is gonna bill for. So it's a complete offset or like a net. So we're producing a little bit more electricity than the house is using. Um, so this is just kind of a typical house, actually two different houses. Um, we've got our rack here, this is where the panels sit. These are little microinverters that convert the DC electric from the panels to AC to make it compatible with the grid and utility power. But ultimately we set this up, we've got like our wiring coming in, install panels on that. Um, real quick, this is what you would call a standing seam roof which is ideal for installing solar on, um, mainly because you don't have to penetrate the roof. You can use clamps that clamp on the seam and that's what you can build your solar off of instead of penetrating directly into like the trusses or rafters, putting holes in the roof. Uh, really nice, so if you have standing seam roof, I'd really look at that. Um, I think this is a, whoop, sorry, let me try and go back. The other one was a delta rib, which is a little different. Um, but those just use a different penetrating method to attach. Um, 
So this is the wellness center that we just did. Um, so this was 138 kW. For this system, it was a really nice Firestone TPO roof that's still under manufacturer's warranty. We didn't want to put penetrations in the roof, so we used um, a ballasted system, um, which is basically just adding weight to the roof instead of penetrating and mechanically attaching to the structure. Um, so we managed to do this whole system without putting one hole in the roof. Um, we maintained the roofer's warranty as well as the Firestone manufacturer's warranty. And um, it's almost there. Uh, we should have the system operational by the end of the month. It's expected to produce 185,000 kilowatt hours per year, which should offset um, 30 to 40 percent of the usage of the building, which is great. It's a huge building. It's got a big pool. If you haven't been there, you should go check it out. It's a pretty amazing building. Um, so, a few more picks here. So, you know, you have kind of some good pictures of our, of our trainees and our crew. Um, I think the majority of those people were from the, from the Pueblo, which is great, and they were with us from the beginning uh, to the end, which is awesome. So with our trainees, with this project, what we did, we set them up with like a Solar 101 orientation training class. Um, we set them up with OSHA 10 and its uh, equipment certification. So by the time the project started, they'd be willing to, they'd be able to just join us and be certified and, and ready to help in the field. Um, and then after this project, which is pretty much right now, um, we're trying to keep the trainees on. Um, so we're uh, providing a, it's like a week and a half or two week um, installation basic training, which is offered through Grid Alternatives um, to basically keep them busy um, and to keep them paid so we can hopefully keep them on and move them to our next project, um, which is great. And that's like the total success of our program is if we can you know, pick people up as we build these projects, go to different communities, get the experience needed, and then they can return and, and have a successful renewable energy company or you know, work with housing or whoever's managing the solar projects. Um, so we had a great group of Great group of trainees on this one, which is, which is awesome. They want to join us. So trying to work through the next project, which may be for Ute Mountain Ute in, in Toyok. We're doing 22 homes there. And then we're also doing some projects up in Washington State for the Muckleshoot tribe um, that we may send them up to help us if they're willing and able to do that. So, you know, we need as much help as we can get in the field too. So it's, it's complete success. Some of our trainees have joined our team um, like three or four years ago. Uh, and now they're either like leading installs, you know, working in the office, doing workforce development training. Uh, it's really great to see. Um, so this is at the wellness center. Um, don't want to go too into the weeds, but we installed the inverters on the roof here. And then we basically just went down the north exterior wall. It's a little like a load center where the inverter outputs get combined. It goes through a PNM meter, AC disconnect, and then right there is our point of interconnection. Um, so fortunately, the electrical service there, uh, it was a 1600 amp service. We were able to interconnect with a 200 amp breaker and they have more capacity on that as well to do phase two, which is great. Um, so this was just a really clean, great install. It was a privilege to work with the Pueblo of Santa Ana and um, certainly appreciated all of their help and support with the project. Um, one thing to note on this is that they did have a backup generator. Um, and a lot of these buildings typically do. They're community buildings, a place where people can go if you know, the community lost power, if there's a community event. Um, this has a backup generator. Fortunately, is downstream from their main service panel, so they had critical loads backed up instead of the whole electrical service. Um, if there was a generator that backed up their entire electrical service, we would have gone on what you call like the line side of that generator, so in between the utility and the generator, um, just so the 
inverter and solar system is not operational while the generator's on um, because then you'll be kind of conflicting. But don't want to get into the weeds there. But ultimately, um, really clean install. Turned out great. Hope to have it on by the end of the month. Um, so just to kind of touch on some other workforce development opportunities within GRID, um, you know, other than our program, you know, we, we do installation trainings, online trainings. Um, we have an associates program, which is great. Uh, we have scholarships, internships, volunteer opportunities. Um, the uh, Tribal Innovator Fellowship, which is great, where we basically um, will take someone on for two years and support their career. Um, careers in professional development, um, you know, and then consultation. Um, so we, we have a lot of workforce development opportunities that can ultimately be tailored to whatever the specific needs are of the area that we're working in. So it could be as simple as working in a location where there's no internet. Um, well, we can't do online classes, we'll go there and we'll teach in person. Um, there's a lot of limitations uh, that we deal with every day. So we just try to be, you know, as flexible as possible to roll it out. And we offer, you know, workforce development to tribal colleges, not necessarily just paired with construction projects. Let's see. This is a little bit more about the Innovator Fellowship, um, which if anyone is interested, um, the application opens on April 15th. 18 months and $50,000 awarded. Uh, it's been a really successful project or program that um, we've been able to attract a lot of good people. So if you're interested, uh, check it out and I'll make sure to leave some, some flyers on the table that has more information. Let's see what else have I got. Um, yeah, I guess that that's you know, really all I have, but certainly we'll be happy to take questions if there are any.